This is the 13th video in a series devoted to complex analysis, and we're really getting into the good stuff here. So today we're going to prove something called Cauchy's Integral Formula, as well as Louisville's Theorem. And so before we get started, I'd like to point out that for today's video, F will be analytic on a bounded domain D, and it will extend smoothly to the boundary of D. And this is, of course, unless otherwise noted, but for almost everything that we'll do, this will be the case. I'd also like to recall a couple of results that we did in previous videos. The first is called Cauchy's Theorem. And that says if we take the integral along the boundary of d, of f of z dz, we get zero. And so notice f is analytic, so any integral of an analytic function around the boundary of a region where it is analytic is zero. Another thing that we did in a previous video is called the mean value property. And that says that 1 over 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of f evaluated at z plus r e to the i theta d theta is equal to f of z. And here r is taken so that z plus r e to the i theta is inside of d. So our first big result today will be Cauchy's integral formula like we alluded to. And it says that for all z in d f of z is equal to 1 over 2 pi i, and then the integral around the boundary of d of f of w over w minus z. Okay, so let's see how we can get into this proof. So I'd first like to maybe take some epsilon bigger than zero so that the neighborhood around epsilon, or the neighborhood around z with radius epsilon. So let's recall that that's gonna be all w in c, such that the modulus of w minus z is less than epsilon. So we wanna choose that epsilon so that this is totally contained in d. And we can do that because d is a domain. Well, it's a bounded domain, and a domain is an open set. Okay, so let's make a little picture of what's going on here. So here we've got our complex plane. I'll put my domain in this first quadrant, although it need not be in the first quadrant. So let's make sure it's open so it does not include its boundary. So there's my domain D. So let's maybe put D here. And then we've got an arbitrary point chosen inside of our domain. We're calling that Z. And we want to find an epsilon. So if we take the epsilon ball, the epsilon neighborhood around Z, it's totally contained in D. So this would be an example of such an epsilon. So notice that has radius epsilon and it's totally contained in D. And looking at this picture, and noticing that this function f of w over w minus z is analytic everywhere in d except at z, considering that as a function of w, motivates us to define a new set. And that set we'll call d prime. So let's set d prime equal to d subtracting off the neighborhood of z the neighborhood centered of z of radius epsilon closure. So we're taking the closure of that. And we're doing that so that we end with an open set. And so let's maybe shade in what we have here. So this d will just be everything in between this neighborhood and the whole set. So that's how we can think about this d. But now by Cauchy's theorem, we know that the integral around the boundary of d prime of f of w over w minus z dw is equal to zero. So let's sneak the zero in over here. And why is that? Well, it's again because f of w over w minus z is analytic on d prime because we essentially removed this point where it's not analytic. But now we can break this into two pieces. We can break this boundary into D and then this circle centered at epsilon. So let's do that. Well, maybe first let's note that the boundary of D prime is equal to the boundary of D and then maybe disjoint union with the set of all W minus Z equals epsilon. So I'll just write it like that. 
So that means we can rewrite this as the integral around the boundary of D of F of W over W minus Z DW, and then plus the integral around this set W minus Z equals epsilon of the same thing. So we've got F of W over W minus Z DW. But there's a little bit of an issue here because this addition assumes that we have this oriented clockwise, this inner circle oriented clockwise, because you always want the orientation so that if you're walking along the boundary, the region is to your left. So this addition would mean that this is oriented clockwise. You look on the boundary and it is to the left. But if we take the standard orientation, which is counterclockwise, we need a minus sign here. So let's change that plus to a minus, and then maybe let's put an arrow just saying there that we're orienting it counterclockwise, which is like standard. Now we can simultaneously parameterize this curve and then change this so that we're solving for this integral over the boundary of D in terms of that other guy. So let's notice that this thing right here, so maybe I'll put a little box around it in green, has a fairly simple parameterization. And that is W equals Z plus epsilon E to the I theta. And here theta is coming from the set zero to two pi. Okay. But that allows us to write the integral over the boundary of D of F of Z over W minus Z DZ, DW I should say, as the integral from zero to two pi of F of W, but notice F of W is F of Z plus epsilon E to the I theta, over w minus z, but let's notice w minus z is epsilon e to the i theta because the epsilon part cancels, and then dw. So what's dw? Well, that's pretty easy to calculate just by differentiating this with respect to theta. So we'll sneak that in here. So we have dw is equal to i times epsilon e to the i theta, d theta. So let's stick that in here. So we'll bring this i out front, and then we'll have an epsilon e to the i theta d theta. Now let's notice that a bunch of stuff cancels. This epsilon cancels with this epsilon, and then this e to the i theta cancels with this e to the i theta. And then we have i times the integral from zero to two pi of f evaluated at z plus epsilon e to the i theta d theta. But we can use the mean value property to say that that integral is equal to two pi times f of z. But if this integral is two pi times f of z along with the i, we have this as two pi i times f of z. And of course, solving for f of z gives us our desired result. Okay, so we finished the proof of this Cauchy's integral formula. Now I'd like to extend this a little bit, um, and we'll do that with a corollary or two. Now we're ready for a quick corollary to Cauchy's integral formula. And this corollary essentially extends the integral formula to instead of values of the function, values of the derivative of the function. So we have the nth derivative of f evaluated at z equals n factorial over 2 pi i, and then the integral around the boundary of d of f of z over w minus z to the n plus 1 dw. And this is going to be true not only for all z and d, but for all n bigger than or equal to 0. Well, non-negative integers, maybe I should say. Okay, so the proof of this is quite simple. We can just essentially differentiate the Cauchy integral formula. So we'll take the nth derivative of f um, is equal to, well, it's taking n derivatives of f of z. But notice that is the nth derivative of, now we can put Cauchy's uh, integral formula in here, 2 pi i, and then the integral around the boundary of f of w over w minus z dw. But now what we'll do is bring that derivative inside of the integral, which isn't quite as sketchy as it seems, but notice if we take the nth derivative with respect to z of w minus z, we get w minus z to the n plus 1 in the denominator, 
denominator and an n factorial in the numerator. And that brings us exactly to what we want. We have n factorial over 2 pi i, and then the integral over the boundary of f of w over w minus z to the n plus 1 dw. So this actually brings us to another very, very important and quick corollary that follows from this. And that is, if f is analytic, that implies that the nth derivative of f is also analytic. And that's going to be for all n bigger than or equal to zero. That's because we can express this nth derivative in terms of this Cauchy integral formula. Okay, but notice that really makes a big difference between complex valued functions and real valued functions. Recall that analyticity is essentially being complex differentiable. And so this says if a function is complex differentiable, then it's infinitely complex differentiable. But you can find a lot of real valued functions that are one times differentiable, but not two times differentiable, or that are two times differentiable, but not three times differentiable. But what this corollary is saying is that kind of behavior is impossible with in complex valued functions. Okay, so let's get rid of this and we'll do some examples. Now we're gonna look at a couple of examples where we use Cauchy's integral formula to quickly evaluate some complex valued integrals. And so this is a little bit confusing because Cauchy's integral formula has to do with z's and w's, but here we only have z's. So if you look at Cauchy's integral formula, the translation is that w is equal to z in these formulas and then z is equal to some number. And so that's like the translation here. So again, w is, or z is playing the role of w, and then depending on what's happening in the denominator, you've got a number playing the role of z. So in this case, the number one is playing the role of z because we have z minus one. That's like w minus z in the formula that we had before. Okay, so notice we've got just a single z minus 1 in the denominator, which means that we have here 2 pi i and then the numerator function z squared plus z evaluated at z equals 1. So it's 2 pi i because, recall, Cauchy's integral formula had a 1 over 2 pi i over here, so we're kind of correcting for that. Okay, so let's notice that that gives us 2 pi i and then 1 plus 1, so that gives us 4 pi i. Nice. Okay, so let's do another one. So let's say we have the integral over the curve z equals 2, modulus z equals 2, so that is a circle of radius 2. I guess moving back to this one, we should check that this point 1 is within this region here, but it is definitely within this region here. This is a circle of radius 3. The number 1 along the real axis is inside a circle of radius 3 centered at the origin. Okay, so now we have the modulus z equals 2, and now let's say we've got z times e to the minus z over z plus 1 squared. So we've got z plus 1 squared dz. So notice that the number negative 1 is applying the role of z here. And our function is this numerator. The fact that we've got a squared means we need to take a first derivative and also multiply by 1 factorial, which is just 1. So this is going to give us 2 pi i and then the derivative with respect to z of uh, z times e to the minus z evaluated at z equals minus 1. Okay, so let's see what that gives us. So we've got 2 pi i, and then the derivative of this with respect to z will be e to the minus z, and then minus z times e to the minus z. So we have something that looks a little bit like that. Okay, but then evaluating this at minus 1, notice we get e to the minus 1 plus e to the minus 1. That'll be 2 e to the minus 1, so we have 4 pi i over e in the end.
Okay, so that's good. So let's do one more. So let's say we do the integral around the circle, which is radius two again, and we'll do the cosine of z over, let's say z times z minus one squared dz. And this is a little bit trickier because we have to break it into two pieces. So let's maybe sneak in a picture of what's going on right here. So here's a circle of radius two, but notice we have something going on at the origin because we've got this z here, and we've got something going on here at z equals one because we've got this z minus one here. So what we'd like to do is shrink this big boundary into two disjoint boundaries, maybe one around the origin and one around the point one. And then we can look at pieces of this function being analytic within those two pieces. So we've kind of excluded one of the poles from one of these circles and the other one from the other circle. Okay, so that's gonna give us something like this. We just have to pick our radius small enough. So maybe I'll pick it to be a quarter. So this is gonna be z equals a quarter of the cosine z uh, over z minus one squared over z dz. So notice that numerator is analytic in this first region right here. So let's maybe put a star or maybe a one here. And we'll put a one here to say that's where that's coming from. We'll put a two here. And this two will describe the other integral. And then this is going to be a circle of radius a quarter again, maybe centered at z equals 1. So here we'll have the integral over z minus 1 in the modulus equals a quarter. And now we view this as the cosine of z over z over z minus 1 squared dz. Okay, so just to reiterate what's going on here, in this first integral, this whole thing is playing the role of f of z. But in the second integral, this kind of slightly different thing is playing the role of f of z. So notice for this first one, we've got just a z to the one in the denominator. So that's just gonna be the function evaluated at zero. So let's see, this thing evaluated is zero, that's cosine of zero over negative one squared. So cosine of zero is one, negative one squared is also one. So this guy gives us two pi i. Then here, this is telling us to take the derivative, the first derivative, and then evaluate at zero. So let's see, the first derivative here will be minus two pi i times cosine of z over, let's see, uh, z squared. We need to evaluate that at z equals one. So that comes from taking the derivative of the one over z part, and then we'll get something from taking the derivative of the cosine part using the product rule. So we'll have a minus two pi i, and then the sine of z over z evaluated at z equals one. So we'll have something like cosine of one and sine of one, which are of course not really nice numbers. We'd probably just leave it like that. Okay, so here are some nice examples. Now let's move on to our next result. So our next result will follow from Cauchy's integral formula and it's called Cauchy estimates. So we'll start by supposing that f is analytic on this disk centered at z naught. So it's all z such that z minus z naught is less than or equal to r. And then if the modulus of f of z is less than or equal to m, on the boundary, so z minus z naught equals r, then the modulus of the nth derivative at the center point, z naught, is less than or equal to n factorial over r to the n times m. So let's recall by the maximum modulus theorem that we proved earlier, the maximum modulus of a function will occur on some sort of boundary. So this is kind of building off of that. Okay, so we can do this just with a string of inequality. So let's start with this left-hand side. We have the nth derivative of f evaluated at z naught, so we have that modulus. But now let's apply Cauchy's integral formula. This is n factorial over 2 pi, and then the integral around this boundary, so that's z minus z naught equals r, 
of, we have f of z over z minus z naught to the n plus one dz. Okay, so that's just an application of Cauchy's uh, integral formula. Okay, now we'll parametrize that boundary just using the standard parametrization of a circle. So here we can parametrize that just kind of as normal with z equals z naught plus r e to the i theta. Notice that that means that dz is equal to i times r e to the i theta d theta. But since that i will be in this modulus, it's actually going to disappear because the modulus of i is equal to 1. Furthermore, notice that z minus z naught will cancel this z naught and just leave us with r to the n plus 1 times e to the i theta in the denominator. Okay, so let's see what we have. So we have this is n factorial over 2 pi. And then we have the modulus of the integral from 0 to 2 pi because that's our parametrization of f of z, but now that's going to be f evaluated at z naught plus r e to the i theta. Then in the denominator, we'll end up having, let's see, r to the n and then e to the i n theta d theta. And that's after some simplification occurs. So notice that a dz will give us an r in the numerator, and then this guy right here, this z minus z naught to the n plus 1, will give us an r to the n plus 1 in the denominator. Those will cancel down to this r to the n. And then furthermore, the same thing happens with this exponential. Okay, so now we're left with something like that. But now we can apply some kind of standard inequalities, like essentially a triangle inequality for integrals. And we can break this down as follows. This is going to be less than or equal to, now we can write this as n factorial over 2 pi times r to the n of the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the modulus of f evaluated at z naught plus r e to the i theta d theta, where we've also done a modulus of e to the i n theta, like multiplied into that. But let's recall that that's on the unit circle, so the modulus is 1. But now we recall that this z naught plus r to the i theta lives on this boundary, and we know the maximum modulus is m for f of z on that boundary. So we know that all of this right here is less than or equal to m. But that means we can kind of factor it out, and we'll have this is less than or equal to, let's write it as n factorial over r to the n, and then we have m over 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 2 pi, and all that's left is d theta. But notice that integral will cancel this 2 pi out, just because that integral will give us exactly 2 pi, but that leaves us with exactly what we needed. Okay, so let's get rid of this and then we're going to move on to another result. Now we're ready for the last result of this video, which is something called Louisville's Theorem. But in order to properly state it, we need another definition. And so we say a function f is entire if it is analytic on the whole complex plane. Okay, now we're ready for Louisville's theorem. So it says that every bounded entire function is constant. So this is much different than what's happening in real variables. So notice something like the sine function, for instance, that is continuous or it's actually smooth on all of R, but it's most definitely bounded as well because it's bounded below by negative one and bounded above by positive one. But what this function is saying is that something like that doesn't happen in the complex numbers. If you are entire, that is if you are analytic on all of C, then you must be constant if you're bounded. So again, every bounded entire function is constant. Okay, so let's see how this proof goes. So let's suppose that f is entire and the modulus of f of z is less than or equal to m for all z in c. So that's like our boundary for f. Now, let's consider the following circle. So I'll call it all 
W such that the modulus of W minus Z is equal to R. And now let's notice by our previous formula, so that uh, Cauchy estimates, we have the following. So notice that the first derivative evaluated at Z, its modulus will be less than or equal to M over R. Let's recall that it was really like M times N factorial over R to the N, but here N is equal to one because we're taking a first derivative. But that's actually a little bit of a problem because notice that this inequality holds regardless of what R is. So that means that we could take a limit as R goes to infinity and that's definitely gonna send this thing to zero. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the modulus of f of z is equal to zero. But if the modulus of f of z is equal to zero, then f prime of z, I guess I should have said f prime of z is equal to zero. But if f prime of z is equal to zero, that means f of z is equal to a constant. All of this stuff obviously hinges off the fact that z was taken to be arbitrary. This kind of thing is true for all z and c. In other words, the derivative is zero for all z and c, making this thing constant. So we've got one last result, which is a nice corollary of Louisville's theorem before we end with some warm-up exercises. We've got one last result, which is gonna be presented as a corollary to Louisville's theorem. This is maybe like the hard part of the fundamental theorem of algebra if we were to prove it using Louisville's theorem. And that is that every non-constant polynomial has a complex root. Okay, so let's do this by way of contradiction. So let's by way of contradiction, suppose that we have a polynomial p of z, which we can write as z to the n plus a sub n minus one, z to the n minus one, all the way down to a sub zero with well, since it's non-constant, that means we need n to be bigger than or equal to one. And since we're going by way of contradiction, we need p of z to be non-zero for all z and c. So if it has no complex roots, then it's never equal to zero. Okay, so now let's define a new function f of z, which I'll define to be one over p of z. But now since p of z is never equal to zero, that tells us that f of z is entire. There's maybe a little bit of work to do there, but I think that follows pretty easily from some stuff that we did earlier. Recall that earlier we proved that if we had a function which was analytic, then its reciprocal was analytic as long as that reciprocal was never equal to zero. So that's essentially what's going on here. Okay, so another thing that we can notice is that f of z tends towards zero as z tends towards infinity. So that's pretty clear because f of z essentially looks like one over z to the n for large values of z. So what does that tell us? That means that um, we have some r such that if the modulus of z is bigger than r, then the modulus of f of z is less than one. And so that's just the proper definition of f of z approaching zero where we've taken our epsilon to be equal to one. We could obviously take it to be an arbitrary epsilon, but this is all that we need here. So also we know f of z is analytic on maybe at all of the points where the modulus of z is less than r, which is closed and bounded. But since it's closed and bounded, that means f of z achieves its maximum somewhere there. Well, it actually achieves its maximum on the boundary, but we don't really need that. So again, that means that f of z is less than or equal to m for all modulus z less than r. So let's just see what we've done here. We've split the complex plane into two places. One place where the modulus of f of z is fairly small, it's less than one, and another place where it's less than or equal to m, so it's bounded. So now, before we move on, I'd actually like to change this to m naught just so that we have a little bit of freedom to use m later. Okay, so now we'll take 
m to be the maximum of the number 1 and m naught. And then note that we have the modulus of f of z is less than or equal to m for all complex numbers z. So what do we have? We have an entire function, which we've just shown is bounded. But now that tells us that f of z is constant. But if f of z is constant and p of z is just the reciprocal of f of z, that means p of z is also constant. But let's recall that one of the first things that we assumed was that p of z was a non-constant polynomial. So that brings us to our contradiction. So what did we contradict? We contradicted this one assumption that we made right here that p of z is never equal to zero. So that means that p of z has to be equal to zero for some z, but that would be the existence of a complex root. Okay, good. So let's maybe get rid of this and I'll leave you with some warm-ups. So now I'll leave you with four warm-up problems and these are all based off of the Cauchy integral formula. And so let's evaluate these four integrals. So one is the integral over the circle z minus two equals one modulus z minus two equals one e to the z squared over z minus two. The next one is the integral over a circle centered at the origin of radius two of e to the z over sine of z over z cubed. The next one is a circle of radius five centered at the origin. Now we have cosine of z over z times z squared plus eight dz. So this one's maybe a little bit tricky, but I think if you think about when the denominator is zero, it should be okay. The next is another kind of tricky one, the integral over a closed curve c of three z squared plus z over z minus one. And here is that closed curve. So it kind of loops back on itself. And just for reference, the point one is right there. Okay, that's a good place to stop.